G'day Space Cadets. This is the first video in a short series which will be focused on a really interesting flyby technique called an aerogravity assist. These videos will make a lot more sense if you're already familiar with regular gravity assists. Even a Kerbal Space Program level of understanding is more than enough. I've linked a nice video in the description by Simply Space if you're totally new to gravity assists or you want a refresher. In this first video, we'll briefly review normal gravity assists, but we'll be looking at the situation from a slightly different perspective that will make aerogravity assists much easier to understand. All right, let's get started. Here we have our spacecraft on a basic circular orbit. It completes a full 360 degree rotation around the planet during each orbit. Let's freeze the spacecraft here and see what happens when we accelerate. As our velocity increases, the apoapsis increases and the orbit becomes more elliptical. The eccentricity parameter E is a measure of how elliptical our orbit is. E is zero for a perfectly circular orbit and it gets larger the more eccentric an orbit is. As the eccentricity gets closer and closer to one, we're still completing a full 360 degree orbit, but we can see that the apoapsis velocity is dropping closer and closer to zero. Our velocity at the apoapsis of an elliptical orbit can never actually be zero, as we would have no angular momentum left to continue the orbit around the planet. We would hover briefly above the planet before falling back directly towards the center. The only way to stop this happening is for us to travel infinitely far away from the planet where the gravitational attraction drops to zero. So let's head to infinity and we'll go beyond later. If we increase our eccentricity any further, our elliptical orbit breaks and becomes a parabolic trajectory, which takes us to the imaginary point infinitely far away. We would arrive at this point with a final velocity of zero. The eccentricity of a parabolic trajectory is exactly one. Notice that now we no longer have a closed 360 degree orbit. We would fly past the planet once and not come back. If we zoomed out far enough, we would see that the incoming and outgoing trajectories get closer and closer to parallel, which means we have rotated only at 180 degrees instead of 360. Now we've reached an important point. I'm going to introduce some concepts that might not mean much to you right now, but keep them in mind. We'll revisit them later and it will all become clear. The strength of a gravity assist is determined by how much deflection you will achieve at a given escape velocity. For the purposes of this video, we're assuming that stronger gravity assists are better. The maximum useful deflection of a flyby is 180 degrees. Flybys with higher escape velocities have a greater potential delta V. Now we need to understand the bigger picture significance of this deflection. So let's zoom out to a solar system level. Here we can see our planet's orbit around the sun. If our spacecraft was escaping the planet on the parabolic trajectory we discussed earlier with an escape velocity of zero, it would end up with the same velocity as the planet in the solar frame. This means it would be on almost exactly the same orbit as the planet, which isn't very useful if we want to explore deep space. To improve this situation, let's consider a simple flyby with a relative velocity of 5 kilometers per second to the planet. When the spacecraft leaves the planet, it is traveling in the same direction as the planet, but 5 kilometers per second faster. This means that it's now at the periapsis of its new yellow orbit. When the spacecraft arrived at the planet on its original pink orbit, it was also traveling in the same direction as the planet, but 5 kilometers per second slower. The flyby occurred at the apoapsis of this initial pink orbit. Note that in both situations, the relative speed is the same, but just in different directions. The relative velocity vector has just been rotated or deflected. In this case, the relative velocity has been rotated 180 degrees. Remember what we said before. The maximum useful deflection of a flyby is 180 degrees. The situation we've drawn here is a perfect gravity assist. This 180 degree deflection of our 5 km per second relative velocity vector has gained us 10 km per second of delta V for free. 
notice that the delta v we gain is equal to double our flyby escape velocity. Therefore, the faster we fly by, the more we can gain. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and in order to see why this isn't possible, let's zoom back into the planet. Here, we can see our planet again, with the parabolic orbit and the relative velocity vectors that we discussed earlier included. The pink and yellow relative velocities are what someone watching from Earth would measure. Now, let's see what happens if this 5 km per second flyby was happening at Mars. Our deflection is nowhere near 180 degrees, so we're not going to get anywhere close to that 10 km per second of delta V we calculated earlier. Let's try Earth now. Hmm, the situation is a bit better, but we're still getting less than half the ideal deflection. Let's get stupider and go try Jupiter. Now we're getting somewhere. Remember what we said before, the faster our flyby speed is, the more delta V we can gain by deflecting our orbit. So, let's see what happens if we increase our escape velocity to 10 km per second. Hmm. Everything's gotten worse. Maybe if we go to 15... Oh no. Alright, let's get mathematical to understand what's happening here. Flybys can be understood from these two equations. The top equation tells us the deflection angle delta as a function of the eccentricity E. In order to have a large deflection angle, we want to have a small eccentricity value, as close to 1 as possible. From the second equation, we can see what is required to have a small E value. We could have a very small flyby periapsis, RP. In practice, this is limited by the radius of the planet. We could reduce the flyby velocity, but as we've discussed before, this limits the maximum theoretical delta V that we can achieve from the flyby. Finally, we could choose a planet with a larger mass and larger gravitational parameter mu. For a given flyby velocity, to get the lowest eccentricity and highest deflection, we want a planet with the smallest ratio of r to mu. Now, let's throw some numbers in. The results are exactly what we would expect given the previous images we saw. Even though Mars has the smallest radius, its mass is so tiny that it still has quite a large r to mu ratio. And even though Jupiter's radius is large, its mass is just enormous, which gives it the lowest r to mu ratio by far, making it the best planet for a strong gravity assist. However, there's a problem with Jupiter. It is really far away, and getting there in the first place to even get the gravity assist takes a lot of fuel or a long time with multiple flybys of the inner planets. Jupiter has an orbital period of about 12 years, so if we want to slingshot via Jupiter to an outer planet, like New Horizons did in order to get to Pluto, we only get one opportunity every 12 or so years when Earth, Jupiter, and Pluto are aligned. Let's see an animation of a regular gravity assist now. When we're far away from the planet, our speed is low and the curvature of our trajectory is small. As we fall closer to the planet, gravity accelerates us and both our velocity and the curvature of our trajectory increase significantly. Let's detour for a second. On any non-circular orbit, we are always exchanging kinetic energy, which depends on velocity, and potential energy, which depends on altitude. When we're at apoapsis, we have more gravitational potential energy, but not enough kinetic energy to continue on a circular orbit at that altitude, so we start falling back down. At periapsis, all that excess potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy, i.e. velocity, and now we have a velocity that is too damn high to remain on a circular orbit and so we drift back up to a high altitude again. We can see in the gravity assist animation that as soon as we start drifting up again, the curvature of our trajectory rapidly decreases and our deflection stops increasing. Wouldn't it be nice if we could stay at the periapsis longer somehow and maintain that tight curvature and high deflection rate? What if I told you there was a way to do this, allowing us to generate huge deflections without needing a huge planet? And there you have it. This is the core of the aerogravity assist concept. Our spacecraft has a periapsis inside the planet's atmosphere and uses the atmosphere to generate an upside down lift force. This lift force, combined with the gravitational force, creates the required centripetal force to stay on a circular trajectory at periapsis and not drift upwards. Now let's see an animation of an aerogravity assist flyby. We enter like a normal gravity assist, but once we get to the periapsis, we rapidly deflect our trajectory while we're in the atmosphere. 
Finally, we depart like normal, except now we've done a 180 degree turn at the planet, where previously we could only do 90 degrees with gravity alone. Let's see that again. Let's finish with a quick summary of the pros and cons. Starting with the problems, an aerogravity assist flyby can only happen at planets or moons which have a measurable atmosphere. Fortunately for us, we have Mars and Venus right next door. The spacecraft will be flying through the atmosphere at extreme speeds of many kilometers per second, which will create huge heating loads. It will also be generating drag, which means we'll be losing velocity relative to the planet while we're flying through the atmosphere. However, if we use the right kind of vehicle and limit the time we spend in the atmosphere, we can still get a strong net gain from the aerogravity assist. To reduce drag losses, we want a vehicle with a very high lift to drag ratio. This is quite difficult to achieve at hypersonic speeds and requires vehicles with sharp leading edges, which experience much stronger heating than any blunt re-entry capsule has ever experienced at Earth. Finally, the vehicle shape and the loads are different to anything that has been sent to space before. New concepts for many subsystems would likely be required. Now to the advantages. If we want to fly to an outer planet like Neptune with a gravity assist, we need to wait until Jupiter and Neptune are aligned correctly, which only happens every 12 or so years. If instead we use an aerogravity assist at Mars or Venus, we only have to wait, say, two or three years for the correct alignment between the planets giving us many more launch opportunities. If instead we want to fly to the middle distance planets like Jupiter or Saturn, the most common strategy currently used is to sequence several gravity assist flybys of Venus and Earth. However, this gives us several years of unproductive flight time. With an aerogravity assist, we can conduct one flyby of Mars or Venus and then head directly to our target planet, reducing the time of flight. As we saw before, there are huge potential Delta Vs on offer limited only by how fast our spacecraft can handle flying through the atmosphere. Finally, getting such large delta Vs from an aerogravity assist means that we can leave Earth with a smaller escape velocity. Therefore, using the same launch vehicle, we could have a much heavier spacecraft. However, it's yet to be seen if this heavier spacecraft also means an increased scientific payload mass. I think that's enough for this video. In the upcoming videos, we'll go into more detail of these advantages and problems. I expect that in the next video, we will discuss the Tisserand plane and how we can extend it to be used for planning aerogravity assist missions. In later videos, we'll talk more about the atmospheric flight phase and the type of vehicle we need for aerogravity assists. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll catch you later.